Good evening. I'm Larry Temple, and as chairman of the OBJ Foundation, it's my privilege, and it truly, truly is a privilege, to introduce this program tonight. We have two stars that are coming on this stage tonight uh, together. I want to tell you about uh, both of them, and then they'll both come out together. Uh, the first one, the moderator, is our friend Bob Schieffer. And what I could say is that Bob Schieffer is the premier journalist of his time. And I could stop right there, and that tells you about Bob Schieffer, because it's accurate, it's true, and that's who he is and what he has accomplished. But I'll tell you a little bit more about Bob. It's a bit of a homecoming because he started here in Austin, uh, but grew up in Fort Worth, and his first assignment was with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And uh, he was there very prominently, the first uh, journalist to go to Vietnam, as a matter of fact, when he was with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And then in 1969, uh, he hooked up with uh, CBS and has a, a great career of nearly 50 years with CBS. Most of you may know him, him uh, for his nearly 25 years when he was the uh, host of Face the Nation. Uh, you could visit with him on Sunday morning on that wonderful program. He also uh, was the anchor for CBS News during uh, that period of time. And Bob, just to show you uh, what other people think about him, he got eight Emmy Awards during his career for his accomplishments. Uh, and he has been picked as a uh, living legend by the Library of Congress. He has more journalism awards than I can recount, and I'm not going to try to recount all of them, uh, but he is uh, one that has earned the distinction of what I said of being the uh, premier of the best uh, of his time. Uh, today, the uh, College of Communications at TCU is called the Bob Schieffer. College of Communications, and rightly so, that's his alma mater. Now, I don't know what it takes to qualify to be a Renaissance person uh, in 2017, but Bob may qualify. If you look at uh, not only his journalism career, but what else he's done, he's written four books, uh, and they are very compelling books, uh, some of them very, very funny stories that he tells. And then Bob has his own country and western band. Uh, he plays and he sings uh, and uh, is delightful. If he's not a true Renaissance man in the broad sense for the world, he's certainly a Texas Renaissance man. And we're pleased to have uh, Bob here on this stage again. He's as good a friend as this library has ever had. He comes here from time to time when we ask him to, and we're always in his debt. And then uh, he will be uh, having a conversation tonight with Madeleine Albright. And Madeleine Albright is widely recognized as one of the truly successful, outstanding diplomats that this world has seen over the last 50 years. Uh, I like to say that uh, maybe Prague uh, gave its greatest gift to the United States when it gave us Madeleine Albright because she was born there and then came to this country. Uh, she first learned about global affairs uh, through her father. Uh, her father, after coming here, was a distinguished member of the faculty at the University of Denver. And she learned about uh, diplomacy from her father. And then after college, uh, she got her own professional start, first with Senator Edmund Muskie, uh, and then later with uh, the famed Zig Brzezinski, who was National Security Advisor to President Carter. She had the opportunity as a younger woman to work with both of them. Then after uh, President Carter left office, she taught at Georgetown University. She was a distinguished professor of international affairs. It won't be any surprise to know that not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, she was picked as the outstanding professor on that campus. Then uh, Bill Clinton got elected and uh, Bill Clinton uh, sought her out, and she became the permanent representative of this country to the United Nations uh, under the uh, first term of President Clinton. Uh, after uh, serving in that capacity, she had proved herself uh, as a person who spoke 
not only with eloquence, but with certainty and with knowledge. Uh, she had a reputation of someone who did her homework and knew what she was talking about when she had something to say. And President Clinton then, in his second term, uh, appointed her Secretary of State. She became the very first female in the history of this country to become Secretary of State in this country. And in that capacity, at that time, uh, she was the highest serving in government uh, female in the history of this country. And again, she got a distinct reputation in that capacity. That reputation was someone who could get things done, who uh, would be accomplished in uh, uh, solving problems, and she was known as a problem solver. Uh, she served, as I say, with distinction during that period of time and earned the reputation that I just mentioned. Uh, after uh, President Clinton left office and she left office, she didn't retire. Uh, she uh, decided she'd write books, uh, and uh, she did. And she uh, wrote a wonderful memoir and some other books during that period of time. And her voice and her judgment were always sought out, uh, not only in this country, but around the world. Uh, and she still is one who uh, has the sense, has the judgment, has the knowledge, has the ability to uh, serve this country and people that seek her advice and counsel. So we are richly blessed and fortunate uh, to have here tonight one of the great diplomats uh, of all time, not just our time, but all time. So would you welcome Bob Schieffer and Madeleine Albright. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this is a real honor for me to be back here, and uh, I love to come to the LBJ Library. It's one of my favorite places. Uh, this year, Madeline, Pat, uh, Madeline and Pat and I have known each other for a long, long time. My wife, and I'm speaking of my wife, Pat. Uh, Madeline and, and Pat <coughs> served on the Beauvoir School Board, which I believe was your first uh, appointed Ooh, office definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> way back then when all our, our kids went to school together and we've known each other for, for, for all that time. And I'd just like to say, Madam Secretary, that uh, this is a wonderful book. It's yeah. fun. And uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly a diplomatic history, but there, there are some great stories about diplomacy in the book, in this whole business of your, your pens. And, uh, uh, before we came out here, I asked the secretary, what did you want to just talk about the book? And she said, no, ask me anything. And well, that's my kind of, that's my kind of interviewee. <laughs> so, but let's start out talking about this book and this whole business of these pens. Uh, as far as I know, there's nothing in the State Department manual that says you can use pens as a diplomatic uh, weapon or a diplomatic tool. How did you, how did all this come about? Well, first of all, thank you. And it's wonderful to be with you, Bob, here in your home. And actually nice not to be doing this on TV, where <laughs> one of the hard parts is when you have a really good friend interviewing you on TV, you think, is he really asking me that? <laughs> so, yeah, he anyway. really did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's wonderful to be here. And thank you all for being here. And, and I hope you enjoyed the exhibit. And, um, it has been traveling around now for a while, for nine years, and been in 22 places and uh, eight presidential libraries. So, wow. so this is how it started. Uh, there is nothing in the manual, uh, but what happened was that um, I went to New York in February 93, and I clearly like jewelry, and what happened was it was right after the Gulf War, and I was an instructed ambassador, and my instructions were to make sure that the ceasefire that had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions, that the sanctions would stay on. So every day I said something perfectly terrible about Saddam Hussein, which he deserved. He'd invaded Kuwait. So after a while, a poem appeared in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, <clears throat> but among them, an unparalleled serpent. So I had a snake pin. And I decided to wear the snake pin whenever we talked about Iraq. 
and so I think you've all seen when the ambassadors finish a meeting, there's a press uh, group out there, and all of a sudden the camera zeroes in, and the reporter says, why are you wearing that snake pin? And I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And then I thought, well, this is fun. I went out and I bought <clears throat> a lot of costume jewelry to depict what I thought we were going to do on any given day. So on good days, I, and I was the only woman on the Security Council, so on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. And on bad days, a lot of uh, voracious animals and spiders and different things. And the other ambassadors began to get it, and they'd say, what are we going to do today? So I then mimic, mimicked President Bush, who said, read my lips, no new taxes. So I said, read my pins. And that's how it all started. <laughs> and it, uh, it did, in fact, become part of our, our diplomatic uh, arsenal. You know, I think uh, <clears throat> uh, Vladimir Putin once said he could tell what the tone of a meeting was going to be by looking at your left shoulder. That is true. <laughs> Well, you know what happened. I mean, I, I really did wear pins all the time, and they be began to figure it out. So there was a time pins got me really into trouble. And what happened was there's a picture, actually, on the 50th anniversary of NATO. Uh, President Clinton and Secretary Cohen and I were sitting in the green room on a sofa. And I don't know which one of us started at first, but we did the hear no evil, see no evil monkeys. We looked like crazy people. And it ended up in Time Magazine. And so I actually found three monkeys uh, pins. So we're walking into the, um, um, there was a summit meeting in the summer of 2000. We're walking in, and President Putin turns to President Clinton and says, I, we always notice what pins Secretary Albright's wearing. Why are you wearing those monkeys? And I actually said, because I think your policy in Chechnya is evil, and he got furious at me, rightfully so. President Clinton looked at me like, are you out of your mind? You're the chief diplomat, and you've just screwed up the, <laughs> the summit. So I, I have, pins have gotten me into trouble. But they also got me out of trouble. So uh, I am, was an inventor of many things as the first woman Secretary of State. And I invented the international uh, kissing uh, procedure when you arrive. You can't really visualize Secretary Baker or Secretary Kissinger having big hugs with people walking in. <clears throat> but, uh, and it was much more complicated than meets the eye. So because the Latin, some kiss on the right and some on the left cheek, and, and the French twice and the Dutch three times. Uh, and then there was Yasser Arafat, just the thought, right? So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I arrived in South Korea and had a really, you know, good meeting with the foreign minister. We'd had a nice embrace, and uh, we had a good meeting. And then I come home, and all of a sudden, um, I get a phone call from a reporter saying, um, so don't you think that the foreign minister should be fired? because of what he said about you. And I said, well, what did he say? And he said, well, I really like it when Secretary Albright comes, because we're about the same age, and I'm this tired old man. But when I embrace her, she has very firm breasts. So what do you have to, to say about that? <laughs> so I said, I have to have something to put those pins on. And so. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think we'd get so racy right away. <laughs> well, since you brought it up, <laughs> there is, and I, I, I would never ask you this, except you wrote about it in, in your book, and it was called the Hooters Incident. Uh, well, now, is that part that, of that this? That is the Hooters Incident. That? Uh, but there, I, I really... <laughs> uh, there was another, and the, these pins are in the show, by the way, so yeah. you, when you see the three monkeys and whatever. But I also, there was a time that um, I was ambassador at the UN, and one of the really hard times was when the Cubans shot down um, yeah. our unarmed civilian planes over international waters. And I was getting calls from Washington all the time to make absolutely sure that we got condemnation of the Cubans. And so the government was very helpful in terms of providing me with the transcript of what the Cuban pilots were saying to each other as they were chasing these unarmed planes around. And everything was translated into English except one word, cojones. 
And so they were saying, we have cojones and they don't have cojones. And so uh, I then went out again to talk to the press. And I came up with a line which was, it's not cojones, it's cowardice. And what happened was I thought that the UN press would faint. And then when I came back into the council, the, the Latin American ambassador said, you never should have said that. That's really barnyard language. So then what happened, as you can imagine, President Clinton said, best line of the administration. <laughs> so, uh, so then he asked me to go down to Miami, where there was a memorial service uh, for the fallen pilots. And it was in the Orange Bowl. And, um, and I was told by the people with me, saying, you know, this is very serious, and you've got to be serious about the whole thing. And I'm walking in through the tunnel that the dolphins come in um, on the arm of the father of one of these people, and 60,000 Cuban Americans stand up and say, Cuba Libre, Madame Cajones. And that is what I know. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so I've had a lot of fun with the pins. <laughs> Well, they really, they really have become part of you. Really? I, mean, uh, I mean, when people think of it, they, they really do think, are these, is this expensive jewelry or? No, or? it's mostly costume jewelry. Uh -huh. uh, and it really was fun to kind of buy things that, that, that I thought we were gonna do that were fun. Uh, and so I have had fun. I have personally revived the whole costume jewelry industry. Uh, <laughs> but I really do think, and part of what I, why I'm glad that the show has done well and that people are interested in it, I obviously love talking about foreign policy. And, and I try to make foreign policy less foreign. And they all have stories. And so it's an easy way to explain something. So I was negotiating with the Russians over the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And I had a pin on that is actually an arrow, but looks like a missile. And um, Igor Ivanov, the foreign minister, looked at it while we we're negotiating. And he said, is that one of your interceptors? And I said, yes. And we make them very small, and you better negotiate. So. Uh, <laughs> And I can explain the whole Middle East peace process through my pins. And so that's the point of it, is really to kind of uh, have it be more fun. And I hope people, I, I'm thrilled with the way the exhibit has been curated here. And it looks beautiful, and, and they're uh, kind of explanations of all the pins. So it's a good way to teach some foreign policy. Well, it, it's also, uh, and I want to talk about something other than the book, obviously, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful book. It's beautifully done, and it's it's, very, very artistic, and uh, and I got a, I, I got a big kick out of it. Well, good, uh, that's reading the point. It. And I mean, I've known you for a long time, but I learned some oh, things okay. in there. Uh, one of the things that uh, is on everybody's mind right now is uh, North Korea, and the president's getting ready to go to Asia. Uh, you went to North Korea uh, and saw Kim Jong Un's father. Uh, just talk a little bit about North Korea and this whole situation, and has it changed since you were there? And well, I do think it's one of the most complicated relationships that we've had. And um, after the Korean War, there never was a peace treaty, just an armistice. And it was kind of a theme that, hap that went on for a long time, and even at the beginning of the Clinton administration. And again, when I was at the United Nations in 93-94, um, the North Koreans were threatening to withdraw from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And one of the things you learn at the UN is not to rise to the bait all the time when somebody comes in and starts saying terrible things about the United States. And so the North Korean representative was there, and it was May, uh, and I was about to have a birthday. And uh, so I said, I would like to thank the North Korean representative for making me feel 40 years younger with his speech right out of the Cold War. I mean, it was really very, very tough. <laughs> So there were a number of agreements that we made with the North Koreans during the Clinton administration, the agreed framework, which was a way to freeze what they were doing. And then finally what happened was in the summer of 2000, the number two guy, Vice Marshal Cho, came to the United States. And we, we were in the Oval Office, and he gave the president an invitation for President Clinton to go to North Korea. And President Clinton said, well, I might come at some point, but it needs to be prepared, so I'm sending the Secretary of State. So that didn't thrill them, but they had to deal with it. But part of the issue was that we have no embassy in North Korea. So it was very unclear what was actually going to happen during that meeting. And we had very little information about Kim Jong-il. 
uh, he, we were told that he was crazy and a pervert. I found out he was not crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, So we finally, uh, I sat in a guest house for a while trying to figure out what was going to happen. And all of a sudden, I get a message saying that I had to go see his embalmed father. So I go to the mausoleum. And one of the things, it's not easy to be an American Secretary of State. And if you bow too low, then you're criticized for paying too much respect to some communist leader. And if you don't bow low enough, it doesn't do any good. But the bottom line is I must have done the right thing, because what happened as soon as I got back to this guest house, they said I could have a meeting with the dear leader. And we had a press conference. And the press conference, it was like something, again, out of the 50s with old cameras. Anyway, I'm standing next to the dear leader. And we're the same height. And I had on high heels. And I look over at him, and so did he. Uh, and <laughs> His hair was a lot poofier than mine. But one of the things I was determined, and again, a pin, uh, and the pictures in the show, I wore a huge American flag. And I thought, if they're going to criticize the US, what's going to happen uh, when they see me and the dear leader and the American flag? I did, in fact, spend a lot of time with him. Uh, and we were in the middle of uh, negotiations. And part of the problem was a, a missile that they were trying to uh, really develop. And they said that it was going to be the last one. And we were in the middle of the negotiations. And the interesting part is that I hold no brief for the North Koreans. But um, the election of 2000 was a little complicated and um, was confusing for Americans. It certainly was confusing for the North Koreans. And I had briefed Colin Powell about where we were. And he, was, um, he wanted to continue the negotiations. Um, and then there was a headline in the Washington Post that said Powell to continue uh, Clinton policies in uh, North Korea. He was hauled into the Oval and told no way. So <clears throat> we have had a lot of ups and downs with them. I think we're in a very, very serious situation at the moment. You said the president, the president is going to China, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and a couple of meetings for a couple of weeks. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, it, is a, it is a very complex situation. And depending upon how the Chinese are reacting, and the South Koreans, and the Japanese. And what worries me the most at the moment is some accident. Because we have planes flying, and they have a number of things going on, and we have ships. And so I think it is a, it is a situation which requires uh, I teach a course, and my, I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. So what are the tools? And my course is called the National Security Toolbox. And at this stage, all those tools need to be on the table. But diplomacy is not a gift. And talking to another country is not a gift. It is the way you commun communicate. And I think we need to begin to have much more diplomatic contact. Are, are tweets? Yeah. 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 Are, are tweets part of the toolbox? Not to this day. And even now, I think they um, have no place in diplomacy. And what you've got are two people that are fairly sure of their own powers tweeting insults back and forth. Uh, and I think it's very, very dangerous. And I think that it must be very hard for the people in our government to try to make the decisions. and some of the people on the other side making decisions, because there doesn't seem to be an overall strategy. And I think that what I'm hoping for, just because I don't know it, <clears throat> and what I, all I know is what I read or see on TV, I think is that there has to be a larger strategy. And the tweets might be amusing, but they really, I think it's very dangerous. Uh, so what advice would you have for for uh, President Trump as he goes to the Pacific for the first time? I mean. <clears throat> to leave his iPhone at home. Uh, <clears throat> but I think that uh, the question here is the order in which he does things. I do think um, I can believe that he has a good relationship with President Xi Jinping of China, and that <clears throat> uh, President Xi Jinping has just had, by all signs, very successful party congress. Yes where he has been made a, a kind of a super leader only um, 
less, one step less high than Mao Zedong, and that he has consolidated his power, uh, and that it would be very useful to really spend time with him and work out some common policy. I also think with the South Koreans, so they, they really do need this. Um, I don't know how many people here have been to the demilitarized zone. You have, and I have, it's, yeah. it's a pretty scary operation. It is. And um, Seoul is only 35 miles away from the demilitarized zone. And so they are the ones that are the first line of attack if there were to be something, and the Japanese also. So I hope that the president works out some kind of multilateral approach. I'm also hoping that something is going on behind the scenes. I do think it's important for us to make clear that we have a deterrent. And that is why the, the missile anti-missile system that's been developed, and this is where it gets difficult because the Chinese don't like us having that THAAD system. And yet that is the very much the first line of defense is to have that there. But I do think that it's uh, important for the president now to see that he needs some kind of a multilateral approach uh, to and the Chinese in the lead on it. And then um, if the Russians could be helpful, that also would be good. But one of the things, that, what I find interesting is how much more difficult the administration makes life for itself. Because <clears throat> the, um, by saying that he was not certifying the Iran nuclear agreement, um, that is a multilateral agreement, it undercuts our credibility if he's trying to work out some kind of a deal with the North Koreans. And so I thought that was an unnecessary step uh, and, and really undermines his position. But I hope very much that he is very circumspect in what he says publicly and very um, forward-leaning in the meetings with their other leaders in order to get some kind of common policy. Uh, the administration has said time and again, China has to do more. Talk about that. What could China do? Should China do more? And, and how do the Chinese look at this situation? Well, I think that the, how the Chinese look at it is the following way, which is that um, they are very concerned that whatever action we all take together will make the regime collapse, and that there will be a lot of refugees streaming from North Korea into China, and they don't want that to happen. The other part that they're nervous about is that should the regime collapse, there would be an attempt to unify Korea, uh, and that our forces would, again, potentially be able to go up to the Chinese border. What, by the way, is interesting is Kim Jong-il, the father that I met with, said that it would be fine if we kept our forces in South Korea. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that, but the Chinese are concerned about that. Um, on the other hand, I would think that they would also be concerned about having a nuclear power on their borders, we do have in common with the Chinese that they don't want more nuclear proliferation. What they can do is the North Koreans really are dependent on them economically. And so the idea is to try to cut off a lot of trade. And there are sanctions that are supposed to be being carried out to really limit what their possibility is. The problem, frankly, and as I said, teach about all this is that Sanctions only work if the leaders actually care about their people. Um, and the quest, the, the, a lot of the North Korean people are starving already, uh, and so maybe the leadership doesn't care. But what the sanctions are also supposed to do is cut off financial capabilities of the North Korean government. And what is going on is the North Korean government is selling a lot of technology and various things to other countries. And there was a very interesting article in the paper the other day about there are North Koreans that are allowed to go out and work. Um, and in order to keep their families safe, they then send money back to the government. Um, and it's part of the deal that they make. So there's an incredible black market going on. There are a lot of companies that trade with North Korea and the Chinese are the ones that can really help the most, but trying to get the international system to keep, um, to keep the, the North Koreans in a box. Our intent has not been to have the regime fold. It just has to behave totally differently. But again, um, there have been various times where the signals we give in terms of talking about the axis of evil um, 
linking countries mm -hmm. that then we do want regime change, then all of a sudden the North Koreans think we need to do that. Do you think uh, tr uh, President Trump should go up to the DMZ for the traditional photo that I, I have very mixed feelings about it because it's fascinating to see and worth seeing. And I think that it um, shows how difficult everything is. On the other hand, um, it is, you've been there, and it's a very weird thing because on the south, southern side, it's a normal place. And then on the northern side, they have this huge building. Uh, there's some question as to whether there's even a back to it, but it really, mm -hmm. and a lot of loudspeakers. And then, in between, there are these Quonset huts, um, and they have one where the negotiations of Pam and Jong took place, and there's a string down the middle of the table to show where the 38th parallel is. What happens now, and I was there not long ago um, uh, after I was out of office, and what now happens is the North Korean, I don't know whether this happened when you were there, the North Korean guards come and look at you in the window. And it's kind of creepy, mm -hmm. and I don't know how President Trump might react to that. So uh, I think that one would have to be very concerned about having not a lot of hoopla with it. The other part that is that standard picture, there's, I have one of me with binoculars yeah. looking into the north. And so it depends on, uh, I would like for him to see it, but I would not like to have him put on some show. So. What is your evaluation of, of the current Secretary of State? I, I think he has a very tough job in the sense that uh, he says things and then the President seems to undercut him. Uh, to the point, can he, whatever his talents, can he be effective when it's known that the President doesn't like him? I mean, and you know how Washington is. And when, when Washington realizes that the president has a problem with it, they don't pay any attention to the, to the underling. Uh, he, he has a hard time getting his phone calls returned. How do you think, how do you think Tillerson's doing? Well, I, I, I wish he liked his job. I mean, that's the feeling I get. I, I loved being Secretary of State and <clears throat> everything about it and having a State Department full of people that actually wanted to be supportive and, and a functioning State Department. And so there are large questions here at the moment in ways that the State Department already has been kind of disrespected um, as this administration has come into office. And one of the ways to tell is the budget. Um, the State Department, the way this, the US budget is set up, the first function is 050 that has to do with the military. And the military has something like over $600 billion. And the next one is international relations, 150. And that's somewhere now um, under $50 billion. And what happened was that the administration initially right away said, let's cut the State Department budget even below of what that is. So that has kind of shown disrespect for diplomacy. And then I think that the question really is, and there's no way to tell what the real relationship is between the president and the secretary of state. I, I do try to find something positive in things, and maybe they're playing this act on purpose, uh, that it's kind of good cop, bad cop. But the way that things are viewed now, there are real questions. I mean, we live in Washington, and you pointed out that there is a lot of gossip. And so people think that uh, Rex Tillerson does not really have a voice. I don't know whether it's true or not. I really don't. But I do think I know how much I counted on having a good relationship with President Clinton and um, being able to see him when I wanted to, <clears throat> being able to call um, and really have a <clears throat> functioning relationship. <clears throat> and, excuse me. and then also what the decision-making process is. How do you interact? with the National Security Advisor and the Secretary of Defense, and you see each other all the time, and the gossip is not good. So I, I have to say, I, uh, I feel that Secretary Tillerson has a very hard job. I am sure he's a very smart man, but it's very difficult. Uh, I would not like to be in the position that he is at this point. Well, how about President Trump? <laughs> how do you think he's doing? Oh. Well, let me say this. Um, I, uh, and I'm, I'm very glad to let it rip, 
uh, but <laughs> partially the following thing. I travel abroad a lot, and I have learned as a former diplomat that it is totally inappropriate to criticize your own country when you're abroad. Texas is a part of the United States, and so I can say what I think. Uh, I am very, very saddened by what is going on. I, have, I am an immigrant. I came to this country when I was 11 years old, and when I describe myself, I describe myself as a grateful American. I have been very proud to represent this country and represent the value system that we have. And what it's like, I love, I used to travel abroad and describe uh, how the executive legislative relationships work and how we make laws and what the role of the press is and uh, the judiciary system. And, and all of a sudden, there's some doubts as to how it's working. And, and I find that I'm very troubled when the president goes abroad, for instance, when he goes to Poland and gives a speech in which the word democracy does not exist and stands next to a Polish leader who's cutting down the press and the judiciary and says how much he admires them. And so he is not representing the value system of the United States. And, and I am troubled by the way that he and Congress work together. And, and this is what I'm really having trouble with. I am tired of normalizing him. It is not normal what is going on now. Uh, um, I have had a very interesting time in the last few weeks. Um, I have been traveling around, but also in the United States. And so two weeks ago, I was with President Clinton in Boston doing a program with students. And then last week, I was with President George W. Bush. And I was with him when he gave that speech in terms of saying, uh, various criticisms of what was going on in the United States without ever using Trump's name. And I think he was really remarkable to give that speech because he's been very respectful and to have him give that speech and have President Clinton say the things that he has. I think people are worried. And I think it's time for us to really make, this is not normal. This is not America. And I think that we need to make clear that the president has to hear what we're saying and that the people around him should hear, and we need to talk to our members of Congress. Let me ask you, uh, and it's back in the news now, uh, this whole business about Russian meddling in our election. I don't think there's any question that they were, whether they, uh, Joe Nye up at Harvard, who you know, uh, a national security expert, said he is convinced that what they were trying to do was really just to try to destabilize, uh, raise questions about the credibility of the press and, and destabilize our institutions because that's what they're uh, doing across, across Europe. He said whether they were colluding with the Trump people, uh, he said he doesn't know. He said in his view, they just sort of got Trump a as a bonus. Uh, <laughs> But what do you make of, of all that? And now it's now, and you know, we're going through this in the investigations that are going on, and it now looks like that that the uh, Clinton, I mean, not the Clinton, the uh, the Democrats paid for part of this dossier that was being prepared uh, by this uh, British intelligence agent and all that. And so it looks like first some Republican donor tried to hire these people to dig up dirt on Trump, and then after he got the nomination, then it shifted over, and the next thing you know, then the Democrats are picking up the tab. Well, what do you make of all that? Well, I, I don't know what to make of all that, but I do think the following thing. Uh, I have spent a large portion of my academic life looking at the role of um, the media in political change, and I um, wrote my dissertation on the role of the Czechoslovak press in 1968, and then I wrote a book about Poland and solidarity. And there's always something new in terms of information dispersal, um, whether it was the printing press or, for instance, in Poland, what was interesting, Lech Wałęsa uh, would give a speech in some factory, and there would be they would tape it on a little cassette, and they'd send that to the next factory. So there's always something going on. And I do think that technology has now played a very large part in so many aspects of our life, that's what you write about. And, and I think that it really has changed things. And so 
I have studied a lot what the Russians have been doing. And um, partially, uh, Putin has said that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the greatest disaster of the 20th century. Kind of weird thing to say, given two world wars and millions of people dying. Uh, but basically, what he has decided to do um, is to undermine democracy in Central and Eastern Europe and separate us from our European partners and undermine faith in democracy in the United States. I think we can't forget that we're dealing with a KGB agent. Uh, and uh, Putin really does know how to use propaganda. He has played a weak hand very, very well. Uh, I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and one of the things that we've been doing is looking at how the Russians have, in fact, uh, militarized information. Uh, and I've just been in Ukraine, and the Ukrainians, we have a team, NDI has a team there, and they gave <clears throat> a very good summary of what the Russians have been doing there in terms of undermining the system, then making clear that everybody that's against them are Nazis, uh, and just uh, really questioning how things work. And I think that they have been fairly successful as we've looked at what's happened in Hungary and Poland and various places. And I think uh, also here. Now, one of the terms that is part of communist uh, parlance is they are always looking for useful idiots. Uh, and they have found one. Um, <laughs> um, and, and I think that whether uh, he's a gift or not, there really has been this kind of back and forth. And I do hope very much that uh, Mueller will be able to look into this. And it is my sense that they really have played a very large part. The other part, and again, you write about this, is how our major internet for our uh, technique firms have also kind of become used yeah. um, by thinking that they need, that they have open platforms and they have figured out how to use the targeting measures that are used for advertising. And so I think we are in a completely different era, which is really, You've been talking about my book, but I think your book really does pinpoint what the issues are and how we are in a new era and that the media has to play it differently and really watch out your conclusions and various things that you've said. Because uh, we are going, and I, I argue in my book that uh, the impact of the, of the web is having as profound an effect on our culture as the invention of the printing press did. Uh, on Europe yeah. in that day. And we all talk about the great things that came out of the printing press. And obviously, you know, they improved literacy. We had the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. But people also forget we had basically 30 years of religious wars before some equilibrium yeah. was reached. And we're right in the kind of the first trimester of this revolution that we're going through now, where, you know, newspapers are going away. Uh, Here's an interesting statistic. Now, one reporter in five lives in New York, Washington, or Los Angeles. So out in the middle of the country in many places, uh, what we're seeing here is it's not biased news. They're getting no news. <clears throat> and and uh, most of the news, uh, 60, when I started writing my book, 62% uh, of us were getting at least some news on social media, Facebook. I think it's up to 67% now. And a lot of people, that is the only, the only uh, news that they're getting because uh, <clears throat> those of us who can afford it, I mean, you and I, uh, I get the New York Times app, I get the, uh, the Washington Post app, the Wall Street Journal app, CNN, CBS, and all of that. But if you're you know, working for a minimum wage on a construction job, you're not going to be able to afford right. that. So the only news you're going to get sometimes in this day is uh, what your browser sort of kicks up by accident or what you get on social media, which is great. But social media, uh, what appears there is not, is not vetted in the way the news we're normally used to getting is vetted. Some of it's true, some of it's totally false. And uh, that's, and this is where the Russians are exploiting that. And there's no question they're doing it here, uh, just like they are yeah. doing, as you point out, uh, 
all, all, across, all across Europe. I think what's very interesting is the Russians now, <clears throat> um, I have just been, because I teach, I actually do have to prepare for class. And the bottom line is the Russians now, I just did a section on cybersecurity, is their uh, chairman of their military has written about the fact that they are using information It's part of their hybrid warfare. This is part of their military doctrine now. And so among the things that they do is they are undermining through putting false information out, but they also are doing cyber things in terms of bringing banking yeah. systems down. And we are not set up in order to deal with all of that uh, at the moment. And the other part, when you're talking about, in order, you read all those newspapers, I do too, and I compare notes about what's, you kind of put together what is the truth yeah. by comparing things. What has happened now is people either are doing exactly what you're saying or not doing, but also they're in an echo chamber, and for the most part, they listen <clears throat> to only what they agree with already. I make it a point of listening to right-wing radio as I drive, which is a mistake, because I get, <laughs> none of you live in Washington, you do, stay away. Um, but I think it's important to listen to things you disagree with. Um, and I think the thing that is so, what is going on now, uh, the lack of information is undermining faith in institutions. So for instance, I stole this line from Silicon Valley. This is totally plagiarized, but it responds to things, which is that people are getting their information on 21st century technology. The governments listen to them on 20th century technology and provide 19th century responses. And so there is no faith in institutions, and the people are in an echo chamber with a limited amount of information. Uh, I think we want to, it's about time to go to the audience for questions, but let me, uh, while you all are thinking of a question you'd like to ask, and I believe there are microphones on, on either aisle here, let me just ask you uh, a political question, because you've been involved in politics uh, as well as foreign policy. What do you think the state of our political parties are right now? I mean, we have now fewer people identify as Republicans or Democrats. Uh, the people who do so, this is at the lowest level ever. Uh, we're seeing basically, it looks to me like the Republican Party just coming apart uh, before our eyes now. And I'm not sure the Democratic Party is in much better shape, quite frankly. What What is your sense of of our whole electoral system. Well, I, I am very worried about it because, um, you know, as I've said now, I'm chairman of the National Democratic yeah. Institute. We go abroad and try to provide people with the nuts and bolts of democracy. And so we you know, talk about how parties should work, uh, what you do in a parliament legislative branch. And so, for instance, uh, I've been out there saying, what you need to do is compromise. And they said, you mean like you guys? So at this point, we are not a very good example of things. I do think that what has happened as a result of technology is that there's a disaggregation of voices, and therefore, people are not joining political parties because they have their own yeah. uh, source, they think, of talking to their governments. And I do think that the parties are confused in terms of what direction they should go in. I, I also do think that what has been the strength of American political parties is that they do have a strong center, and there are always on the left and the right, but at the moment, I think it's the extremes that are having more influence. And so I am worried about our party system. I do think that Citizens United was the worst Supreme Court decision that undermined the system. Uh, um, but on the other hand, I really, uh, you know, I'm often asked if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. Um, and so I am optimistic about our system and the resiliency, and we're seeing some of it. But I am particularly worried that we don't understand well enough our institutions, and it's actually the local and state level that is the one that's yeah. closest to the people. And I think that that's where we need to put more and more well, uh, emphasis. Our best and brightest are turning away from running for right. office rather than being the ones who do right. uh, run for office. And I often tell this story. You know, when I was a little boy, 
My grandmother thought I was going to be president of the United States one day. And you know why? Because that's what every grandmother thought about her grandson. But how many people lately have you heard say, I hope my child grows up to be a politician? We have made running for office in this whole thing so odious that good people just don't want to fool with it. Who wants to have to, you know, spend 20 hours a week making cold calls to raise money, which is what you have to do when you're in the Congress. And and I, we've got to find some way to get by this. And this, what you're talking about, uh, the Supreme Court decision, which I I would totally agree with you. Basically, we have no campaign finance laws now. Here's a little interesting statistic that I found when I was running, when I was writing uh, my book. In 19, by 1975, 32 people, uh, and this was after Watergate and all of that, 32 people had gone to prison or paid substantial fines for campaign finance law violations. Today, every single thing they went to jail for is legal. Wow. So we're going backward. Yeah. We're not going forward. And I think we are kind of reaping the benefits of all that right now. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that happened uh, this year. Uh, so who'd like to have a, a question out there? There's a man. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, I wanted to pick your brain a bit on um, climate-related issues. Uh, The more I read, the uh, upheavals in Africa and Asia and the Middle East often are caused by huge migrations of people that are losing their farmland from drought and all kinds of extreme weather events that are causing upheaval around the world, yet no one really is connecting that. Could you talk a little bit about the impacts of rising sea levels and extreme weather events and how it affects the political atmosphere around the world? Well, I think that, um, you know, we all got, our generation got used to the problems and uh, that there might be a nuclear war. And we all went into shelters and learned all kinds of things. And just because climate change doesn't seem to uh, have that immediate effect, it doesn't mean that it does not in the long run uh, is totally destructive to the planet. And by the way, the Earth is not flat. Uh, and uh, there really are scientific proof that their climate change is something <laughs> that uh, is affecting all of us. I think that one of the things that is uh, one of the worst things that the administration has done is pull out of the climate change agreement. It is an agreement. It is not a treaty. Um, And it was set up in a way, frankly, to allow states to have a certain amount of leeway in terms of the way that they began to deal with the problems of of climate change. What is evident is that, I mean, the world now is full of migrants. And the migrants, a lot of them are created by uh, the problems of climate change. In Africa, for instance, Wars have come about because of desertification. That is what was going on in Sudan. People cannot uh, find food. That is why there's migration into Europe and their questions. And then that they really the, the the media there is using migrants also as a way to undermine the system. So there are any number of ways that I can argue that climate change is a national security problem and needs to be seen that way. The question is. What happens if, in fact, in, that the states do various parts to follow, to carry it out, and the nation does not? And so I do think that we all that have any sense of understanding of this have to say that this is a danger to us. And uh, given what the weather's been doing this year uh, in Texas and various places, you would think people would get it. Um, the problem is that the scientists are so honest that they will not directly say that X storm Harvey was created by climate change. I can, it seems to me that when they tell us that the ocean is warmer as a result of climate change, and that's why they're hurricanes, you'd think we could figure it out. Yeah, very good. Anyone else? Yes. I'm here. (laughs) First of all, uh, there is a term that is bandied around a lot these days, It's called thank you for your service. I'd like to share that personally, that we do thank you for your service. You did a tremendous job. Thank you. you. 
But my question has to do with something that's disturbed me for some time. So I was once in a meeting that was being conducted by a retired Air Force colonel who was in the intelligence service and had retired and gone to work for one of these think, think tanks that dream up scenarios for the military to be involved in. And he made a statement that disturbed me deeply. He said that the State Department doesn't have the wherewithal to conduct diplomacy and that the military has people on the ground who know the countries, know the situations, and therefore they should be the ones conducting diplomacy. That was a powerful statement that stuck with me for a long time. I'd sure like some reassurance from you, please. Yeah. Well, first of all, if I could, thank you very much for your kind words. And, and I'm going to restate something, which is that, again, I'm an immigrant. And I, the thing that I love most of all to do is to go to naturalization ceremonies and give out their, I have a naturalization certificate, and I give it out. I can't swear people in because I'm not an officer of the law, but I can give them out. And all of a sudden, I hear this man saying, can you believe it? I'm a refugee, and I got my uh, naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State. And I said, can you believe that a refugee is Secretary of State? And that is what this country is really about in terms of. Uh, uh, so it was really my honor to be Secretary of State. I am the last Secretary of State of the 20th century and the first of the 21st. And what happened was I actually started saying it a few months after President Clinton named me, which was really presumptuous that he would keep me for the four years. He did, and so I am. But the bottom line is that I think that the issue that you've talked about, which is the State Department and the Defense Department and who does what, is something that is relatively new in the 21st century. And part of it is a result of the fact that we have been at war for a long time. Uh, and that the, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan has been uh, in countries that have needed, um, by the way, nation building is not a four letter word. It is a matter of trying to develop um, institutions so that people can run themselves. And part, one of the hard parts is that the people that go into the countries to help need security. And so then the idea is that the military helps to protect either the non-governmental organizations or the diplomats. So that is kind of how this starts happening. But what has happened, because we've been at war, is that some of the tasks that the State Department is supposed to do has kind of morphed over into the Pentagon. I think it is most unfortunate, and it is being exacerbated by this current budget. So that, in fact, there, um, the State Department does not have the wherewithal to be everywhere and the Defense Department does. And so that is, is something that is very troubling. And then another part, and you were talking about young people not wanting to go into public service. I am finding that my students that are in the School of Foreign Service, which is about international relations, have come to me and said, given what has happened at the State Department and the hiring freezes and deciding that they're not gonna take in a lot of the people that uh, get fellowships, they're saying, why should we take the Foreign Service exam? Yeah. Why should we have anything to do with it? And we are cutting off the pipeline. No matter what this administration is doing, in the long run, you have to have diplomats. And I do think that to go back again to the president's trip, there is nobody in Washington. There's not an assistant secretary for that part of the world. We don't have ambassadors in those countries. And so it's kind of by default what you're talking about is happening, and I think it is a disaster because um, it, it, uh, the State Department is the premier department in the U.S. government. Uh, it is the one, Thomas Jefferson was the, one of my predecessors. Um, <laughs> but, um, and you know, we're now celebrating the Marshall Plan and various aspects, and so there are scenarios like that, and I think it's very troubling, and I think it's very important to argue against it because the military cannot do everything, and we need diplomats. All right. Here's one more. I really like this pins exhibit, and I especially like the silver pin that depicts 
a woman in a room full of men. So I, I'd like to ask you what words you would say to young women today who, who uh, might go into politics. What would you say to encourage them to go into politics? Well, I um, do do that on a regular basis, but I, I really do think the following thing is that, uh, pub, first of all, public service is one of the great uh, honors uh, of life. I really do think that. And I also do think that um, it is a country is better off if it is being uh, run by the people, the majority of the people that are in it. And in many different ways, we are wasting a resource by not having enough women in public office and in uh, a variety of positions. And I do think that it is very important to encourage young women to be part of, uh, of running the country and um, having a variety of different jobs. I do think that it means, however, that a lot of young women have to work very, very hard. I don't wish to insult half the audience in this room, but there's plenty of room in the world for mediocre men. There's no room for mediocre women. And so women have to work extra hard. Uh, and I do think that um, women have to be involved uh, in various ways, and we have to support each other. Now, I made a very famous statement once. It was so famous that it was on Starbucks cups. Uh, <laughs> is that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. And I believe that. Women, we need to support each other and not have the queen bee syndrome, which is if there's only going to be one job, I'm going to have it, and some other woman isn't. Uh, we are stronger when there are more women in the room and can help each other. Now, there are people who think that it would be better if the whole world were run by women. If you think that, then you've forgotten high school. But I think it's uh, uh, important to uh, have a, uh, a co-ed system where we can, in fact, work together, but it really does require women that are willing to work, put up with some of the things that happen, and help each other and be trained in order to really be partners in uh, running our country and running the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Madeleine Albright. Thank you.